welcome back to this week of American Musical Theater. We're talking about another opening, another show. On October the 6th, 1927, the world of showbiz turned out for another opening night celebration. The star of the show at the Warner's Theater on Broadway was Al Jolson still, but he wasn't on stage. In The Jazz Singer, a movie, he was on the screen. It was something new, a talking picture. There had been shorts made of people singing and singing and singing. But there had never been a movie of an actor singing and talking and integrating scenes and songs. And if there was nothing that Al Jolson could do, it was definitely always try to be on that cutting edge because his whole life is staged. He didn't really have a personal life. So in this talking picture called The Jazz Singer, the, the seminal moment was he's playing a song for his mother in her apartment at the piano, not in blackface, thankfully. And he finishes the song and he turns around and he starts to talk to her. People just weeped. Let me give you a little taste of that. In the orphanage when I get sad. He was singing Blue Skies, a happy song. And there's his dear sweet mother listening to him. Blue sky, smiling at me. Nothing but blue skies do I see. Oh, don't know, blue birds singing a song. Nothing but little blue birds all day long. I never saw the sun shining so bright. I never saw things going so right. Noticing the day, hurrying by when you're in love, oh, don't it lie. Blue days, 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 all of them gone. Nothing but blue skies from now on. You like that, Mama? I'm glad of it. I'd rather please you than anybody I know of. Oh, darling, will you give me something? What? You'll never get. I'd rather please Such you than right, anybody Mama. else. Got him for little Jackie. Huh. And that was probably true if he'd had that kind of relationship. That's when the talkies were really born. Out of that star performer reaching out to the audience, even from a film, even from a flat surface, they know he's not even there. But the shift away from silent film was a cosmic shift. In Hollywood, the silent movie had been a popular form of entertainment. As popular as vaudeville, probably. Um, nearly as popular, anyway. For the deaf actors, there were many who had been consultants for the body language used in silent film. There were a lot of jobs in Hollywood for deaf actors who could give feedback on whether the communication was going through during the silent movies. There's a book by Albert Ballin who recalls those days. And he says, not only was deaf eyes something that the silent film director depended on to help tell the story, the structure of the visuals were influenced by sign language. How you would construct an image made movie followed the same image influenced language as ASL. So the structure of the visuals being influenced by sign language, how one image connected to another, how the story was constructed. Uh, and what was interesting to me is how respected the deaf community was at that time. Uh, they used deaf people to consult on the movies. And when Albert Ballin directed Two Little Girls to Sing and Sign the Star Spangled Ballad, there was a huge reaction to this. People loved it. They were touched. They were moved. It was like watching dance and sing and movement all at the same time, but it had meaning. It had a foundation that even if you didn't know sign language, you felt like you knew what they were really saying. And at that point, they felt, Ballin, 
a lot of other people who were working in Hollywood in the deaf community at the time thought a real change might happen because the reaction was so strong. But then in the blink of an eye, it was all over. And suddenly the industry had moved to talkies, which now put it in very direct competition with Broadway. The success of the jazz singer was the first blow of a mighty one-two combination that would send uh, Broadway really, really reeling. The second punch was, of course, the Great Depression. They used to tell me I was building a dream, and so I followed the mob. When there was earth to plow or guns to bear, I was always there, right on the job. They used to tell me I was building a dream with peace and glory ahead. Why should I be standing in line just waiting for bread? Once I built a railroad I made it run, made it race against time. Once I built a railroad, now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime? Once I built a tower up to the sun, brick and rivet and lime. Once I built a tower, now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime? Once in khaki suits, gee, we look swell. Full of that Yankee doodly dum. Half a million boots went slogging through hell. And I was the kid with the drum. They called me Al It was Al all the time Why don't you remember I'm your pal Say, buddy, can you spare a dime? Once It got to be very desperate times People were absolutely on the street, having been kicked out, evicted, lost all of their money, everything they had. The crash of the stock market in October of 1929 put an end to Broadway's feverish expansion. The collapse of Wall Street was best captured in the slang used to describe an act that flops. It laid an egg. In theater, trade papers, like Variety, they printed... No joy on sale, Broadway kicked, healed, punched, and gouged by Wall Street, who came within an inch of its nightlife last week, shattering all records for gloom in the country. The bottom dropped out of hilarity. The biggest producer on Broadway, I've been talking about him since we started, Florian Ziegfeld, he was hit the hardest. When the stock market began its alarming plunge, he was in court. He was testifying because he was unhappy over a $1,600 bill for a marquee sign. By the time he left court, Broadway's greatest showman had lost over $3 million. And those are $1929. So he was broken. People said they'd never seen Ziegfeld like this before. His daughter, Billy Burke remembers pulling his head down and taking him into her arms and saying, oh, the poor old darling. And what Ziegfeld said through his great struggling sobs was, I'm through. Nothing can save me. All of those shows, all of those actors, all of those people who worked for him, they were all out of work too. After the stock market collapsed, 
the slow trickle of Broadway talent that had already been going to Hollywood became a flood. People were heading out to where they thought they'd be able to make some money. Let me give you a little bit of that feeling. When the wintry winds start blowing and the snow is starting in a fall, but knowing that's the place that I love best of all. California, I've been blue since I've been away from you. I can't wait till I get going. Even now, I'm starting in a call. California, here I come. Right back where I started from. Where bowers of flowers bloom in the spring Each morning at dawning birdies sing And everything a sun kiss Miss said Don't be late That's why I can hardly wait Open up that golden gate California, here I come So there was hope for the entertainment industry, but Broadway was suffering. Everybody came out to get a Hollywood salary. The Gershwins used to have a show every season, sometimes two, but suddenly that dried up. You couldn't get the financing. No one could. And they came out to Hollywood and they started writing pictures. All kinds of pictures. But the most interesting thing is all of their pictures were about living in New York and doing Broadway shows. They had everyone out there. They had the Gershwins, Rogers and Hart, Marilyn Miller, Florence Ziegfeld tried, Fred Astaire. Fred Astaire's first appearance in a movie, he was himself Fred Astaire and flying down to Rio. He was that big a star on Broadway, but unknown in Hollywood. Besides adapting Broadway hits, Hollywood created flimsy backstage stories about the production of musical comedy. I mean, review those films, 1930s and 40s. They may have been made in Hollywood, but the subject matter always dealt with New York City because New York was the center of America. And of course it was natural that Hollywood would be attracted to the world and the mythology of Broadway. The world still wanted Broadway, even if it was a movie version of the Broadway hoofer. They wanted to see Broadway as if through a keyhole with the backstage stories. At least a hundred movies made in the first, uh, let's say five years of talking pictures incorporated the world of Broadway. The first talking picture to win an Academy Award, for example, was the Broadway Melody. The world of Broadway had actually become the world of American entertainment. Let me give you a little Broadway melody. dancing, the same stories, the same type of Broadway reviews that had worked so well on Broadway were now in Hollywood. Everybody came out to get that Hollywood salary. They were hungry. And in the movies, in the movies, Broadway was a magical world. It was the place where anything could happen. And so it was perfect for the magical realm of this new technology of film. 
You're going out a youngster, but you'll come back a star. That's the Hollywood myth about Broadway, and it's the Broadway myth about itself. Plenty of people can make a living, but only a few truly become stars. But isn't that true of any business? Plenty of people can get a paycheck, you can get a job, but only a few get to be CEO. Same thing, you, you don't even know the names of more than half of the people who make their livings their whole life doing Broadway and doing regional and doing summer stock and doing theater. There are plenty of people who are doing that. We just don't hear about them. They're not, they're not the stars. Let me give you a little 42nd Street if I can. was struggling with a deepening depression. But if Hollywood offered what George Gershwin called a Western tan and a pocket full of money, Broadway promised something else, creative freedom in the depression era. That freedom would inspire songwriters like Cole Porter, Rogers and Hart, and the Gershwins to produce their greatest works. Just listen to some of these. Once I get past the tap dancing. Some more Rogers and Hart and some Cole Porter. I think 
you'll like it. I think you'll get intrigued now that you've started to listen to lyrics and see how they fit with the music. We are now definitely heading into the jazz age and jazz music. We've moved out of ragtime and we're moving straight on in to popular music. Now, during the Depression, the federal government came to the rescue. I don't know if we're going to have that happen here with our COVID situation, but the federal government came to the rescue of Broadway with financial support from Roosevelt's New Deal and from the WPA. Those creative works provided theater folks with work and let them have the creative freedom to not need to live completely on ticket sales, which meant that they could take more risks in their writing. They could go for the art. They didn't have to worry about whether, ah, that's how the audience knows me, so I have to perform that way. They could actually decide what they wanted to do and what they thought would be really art. Uh, you know, in Europe, most of their theater is subsidized. They have ticket sale needs too. But in America, we're commercial, we're a capitalist society, and so that meant that whatever money you raised is the money you had to create a show. And that put on pressures that often led to some, some I don't know, unartistic choices, let's say, like minstrelsy. But once the burden of the financial pressure was lifted because there were grants and there were these federal programs coming in, you started to see shows that were a lot, a lot more aware, a lot more woke, a lot more inclusive of diversity and different opinions and different ways of thinking. We are in a similar time right now and new ideas are percolating. Online performances are experimenting. But if we could get that federal support, you'd be amazed at what people would create, the sort of growth that could happen, and the sorts of shows that would start to show our cultural values, our generation's values, and tell the stories of now, um, and not just follow a formula that we know works. You can see how Hollywood got in that. There are a lot of films that follow a formula. You have Jurassic Park 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 9, 10, Terminator 1, 2, 3, Predator, Alien 1, 2. They follow a pattern because they can sell tickets, um, which is not a bad thing. A lot of people really, <laughs> that's entertainment. That's entertainment. Um, but when you're free from that economic need, then I think you start to see the actual artist's soul and what it is that they would create if they could just have a plain conversation with their audience, direct, one-on-one. -on -one. And that's kind of what I'm hoping will happen as we, uh, as we go along. So let me leave you with a little bit of depression hopefulness from the musical Annie. The sun will come out tomorrow. There you go. Whether they live or die, with your help, we could convince them that with a little extra effort on their part. I want to say something. There's this song I used to sing in the orphanage when I'd get sad. It always cheered me up. Eleanor! Just thinking about tomorrow Clears away the cobwebs and the sorrow Till there's none When I'm stuck with a day that's gray and lonely I just stick at my chin and grin and say, oh, the sun will come out tomorrow, so you gotta hang on till tomorrow, come what may, tomorrow, tomorrow, 
And that's what I'm hoping you guys will think about as we go into our next week of American Musical Theater. Talk to you soon. Bye.